I'm Aziza Al Hibri, and I'm an American Muslim immigrant. I came to this country in 1966 from Beirut, Lebanon. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey. Like many of the people who spoke before me, I was deeply religious. I came from a leading religious family in my country. My grandfather had established uh, the Islamic Scouts movement in the whole world. Uh, he has established an orphanage in Lebanon and was heading the Islamic school system. And he was very dear to me. As I was growing up, my father, very young in my age, brought me a sheikh to teach me the Quran. So I was reading very early and having discussion with the sheikh about what I read that both educated me in religion and also in the skills of the classical Arabic language. It was a very important time in my life to be rooted in all these important religious experiences. But at the same time, there was something very unusual happening in my home. My father was very protective of me, almost restrictive, and it was always in the name of religion. But it took a while, much longer later, for me to realize that having lost my mother when I was three years old, he was just decided that he was not going to lose me. And he was very possessive. But he used the religious argument. And so as I grew up, I felt that I was suffocating. And that perhaps all his claims about religion were suffocating me. And so the minute I went to the American University of Beirut, after my male cousin came to my father and promised he will look after me and I will be okay at the university, uh, that I started noticing that my cousins lived a little bit freer than I did, <laughs> and also other people at the university. And I became exposed to secular Western culture. After finishing my school at American University, I came to the United States to continue my education. And this is where I actually started a full-fledged rebellion. I never totally gave up my belief. Uh, that belief was very deeply entrenched. It was just submerged for a while as I became Marxist, thanks to my professors. <laughs> <laughs> and on my way to the U.S., just a few months before I came here, I was heading the debating uh, club at the American University, and a distinguished American uh, guest passed through Beirut who was invited by our club to speak. Our university, the dean of students, said, we don't think he should speak on our campus. And I went and asked him, why not? He said, he'll give a very bad impression of life in the U.S. There is no need to uh, show our dirty laundry in Lebanon. We insisted on our right to freedom of speech, and Malcolm X did come to campus, and he did speak. After he spoke, we corresponded, and he came again, and on his second trip, I saw him to the airport. And he gave me a little gift, a book, and wrote on it an inscription I didn't really fully understand at that time, which says, basically, Go on, you'll be a great Muslim woman leader for Muslim women's rights. And I was thinking, what? <laughs> it, when we were at the airport, I was just a kid then, and he decided to buy me some ice cream and talk. I remember we had a very nice talk, and he invited me to Harlem when I came to the U.S., because then I had decided to come to the U.S. and do my graduate education. It was a couple of months later that I heard on the news that my friend had been killed. And it was a really bad loss for me. I don't know how many of you have lost parents early on in life, but that scars you for a very long time. And you don't handle losses after that very well. And I remember going into my room, closing the door, and deciding that I'm going to die out of hunger. It didn't happen. And when I then came back to the, came to the United States, the first thing I did when I took the cab, I arrived in New York, I asked the cabbie, I said, I need to go to Harlem. 
And he said, why? I said, because I promised to see Harlem. And the driver said, okay, I'll take you. So he drove me, and at one point he stopped the car, and he said, you, look, you see over there? I said, yeah. He said, that's Harlem. You don't want to go there. And he laughed. <laughs> well, but that set the tone for how I understood American life and how I understood very early on my alliances uh, with various people in the U.S. When I came here, the civil rights movement was raging, and it was a very simple thing for me to become part of it because I had understood what Malcolm X had told me. I also saw the anti-war movement, and I became part of it. I arrived here in 66, and I was able to be part of all these things. And then as I grew up, I felt that there was something missing. In all of these events, I felt that the woman in me wanted to say something, to take more of a central role. I was used to the central role in the country I grew up in. True, my father was restrictive, but I was recognized as much of a person in the religious arena as the next guy. And my grandfather, who had many grandchildren, before his death, called me. He sat me next to him and he said, you're my granddaughter and you're very young and probably I'll die before you're old enough. But I want you to remember two things I'm going to tell you now. And when you grow up, think about them. And then he confided in me two very important ideas that represent his very deep thoughts about religion. And as I grew up, not only did I think about those two messages, but about the fact that he didn't get any of my male cousins and put them next to him and say, this is what I want you to think about as you grow up. It became clear to me that my grandfather has chosen me for leadership in the religious arena. This might be difficult to understand in light of what we see today. But no patriarch in this world who is a Muslim can stand in front of me and tell me that Islam will prevent me from doing what I'm doing. There is absolutely no religious backing, and I know that because I've studied the religion. That's the power I have. After I came to the U.S. and I got seduced by Marxism, I wrote a great deal of secular feminist uh, literature. Uh, the first one I remember was in 75, when I was getting my PhD, I read at the Society for Women in Philosophy. That was the first meeting of the Society of SWIP, and SWIP has represented a very important force in my history, that and the National Women's Studies Association. These two organizations gave me the family I did not have in the United States. And I remember when we first went to SWIP, that some of the women started talking about religion. Oh, God, how boring. Didn't they grow up? I thought, you know, I was religious too, but now I found Marxism. <laughs> and then I noticed what the women around me were doing. They immediately fell into a self-criticism mode and realized that there should be a place at the table for everybody. And we should respect everybody, regardless of whether they are secular or religious, uh, gay or straight, um, uh, white or non-white. And that was a wonderful, wonderful milieu for me to grow in, in terms of tolerance and in terms of building a family. And the same thing happened at the National Women's Studies Association. So I went on from there to teach feminism at Texas A&M which was a challenge. Um, <laughs> in fact, many of my students were from the Corps of Cadets. <laughs> and um, then at one point, I felt that I'm really committed to change, that I didn't want to talk about women's rights. I want to get them. And that if I continued to be a philosopher and write, I didn't know myself how to go about changing the world. So I thought a lot about it. I was just about to come up for tenure, and I could have had a very easy life after that, just get tenured and sit in College Station. Uh, but instead, I decided I'm going to make an important move. I'm going to become a student again, and I went to law school. Very tough, because I had these male professors 
lecturing to me, making many fallacies. My PhD was in logic, and I really <laughs> <laughs> very much wanted to tell them, but then I soon realized that that's not what you do in law school. <laughs> Law school was a turning point. I have to tell you that as Letty talked about um, superstition, there is a way I think many of us who are religious feel, that, and, and you also spoke about it, that God talks to you in different ways. But you just have to be sensitive and listen and you shall hear. And what I find out is that what I want is not necessarily what's best for me. Look for the signs. See what doors open and what doors close. Well, what happened was, while I was in Texas on my way to law school, I had a very personal crisis. And I sat and thought about it. I, by then, I had a couple of friends uh, from the community. And they were very religious people from Saudi Arabia. And uh, I remember telling the wife uh, you know, about my problems, and she would chat with me. And her husband was very religious. So one day I looked at him and I said, would you please, you know, pr when you pray, remember me in your prayers, would you please pray on my behalf? And he looked at me and he said, you know, nothing is stopping you from prayer. Do it yourself. I thought, how uncooperative of him. <laughs> <laughs> then I thought, you know, and who needs this guy, right? <laughs> I'll go pray. <laughs> and then I went home. I remember it was, uh, it was morning, a uh, real early morning before sunrise. Um, I was in Bryan in my bedroom, and I decided to pray. I had done it many times before, but I had not done it since I became enlightened and Marxist. <laughs> so I decided to do it. I remember this strange feeling of bowing, kneeling to the floor in front of God. And as I was doing it, I was telling myself, you Marxist PhD, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, but that's exactly what I need to do. And suddenly, I felt a peace I had not felt before. And you know how some women speak about the hole in here? That hole disappeared. And I knew that's what I should be doing, and I went back to religion. So when I went back, I went back on my own terms. I had a special relationship with God. I didn't need anybody to teach me the Quran because I've done that. I can read it on my own. I can think on my own. I don't need anybody's interference. And so when I went to law school, I went to law school with that in mind. But at the same time, I thought, I've rebelled enough I've talked about patriarchy enough. You know what? I don't even know patriarchy, the patriarchy I'm talking about. After all, I grew up in Lebanon. We talk about Western patriarchy. We talk about capitalism and the t its tools. I've never really experienced it. I never had to work. So I decided that if I'm going to speak about something, I better experience it. And so I went to Wall Street and became a corporate lawyer. <laughs> It was really quite an experience, <clears throat> including the time when a partner wondered if I do the uh, dance of the seven veils. <clears throat> but on the whole, I learned a lot, which was very important for later life. And then I understood that my mission is not in being there, but in teaching. And the door opened when a journal of law, in case Western Reserve, just contacted me out of the blue and said, uh, by the way, could you write us an article on, Isl uh, on uh, Islam and democracy? And I thought, what a topic. Um, and why me? It really came out of the blue. It was not fashionable then to have this talk. This is way before. <laughs> and I thought, I'll do it. I talked to the law firm, asked them to give me release time, took it. Started researching very little on it. Finally found some ancient stuff, was able to translate it into modern terminology, and I did it. The Muslim man in my community, oh God, really, I really ran out of time, were very supportive. 
And in fact, they started giving me more and more ways to improve my research and become, become really a, a jurist in the real sense of the world, word. And when my article appeared, they actually reprinted it and distributed it. So I felt a great deal of support from some of the enlightened men. I was not fighting against everybody. To make a long story short, uh, during that period, I went to many international conferences, including Beijing, and there I discovered that my wonderful feminist sisters that I've known for so long, that their international face is different from their national face. And I realized that what they're trying to do is basically uh, act patriarchal towards my sisters, the Muslim women abroad, and that my sisters, the Muslim women, need to be helped from my sisters, the Western feminists. So I established the uh, organization called Karama. Karama means dignity. And this comes from the Quranic verse which says, we have given dignity to the children of Adam. That means men and women. And so Karama beca began to be an educational organization. This is what we do. We develop feminist jurisprudence, which is totally, totally based on tradition. We don't invent things. We don't reject tradition. We just show how patriarchal men have distorted that tradition. And I have taken my message to no less than 14 Muslim countries where I sat with legislators, I sat with mullahs, I sat with women, lawyers, and grassroots women, and I explained my message. And in every place, I was well received. There have been a few times where I wasn't so well received until we talked a little bit further. But what I'm trying to say is that in the Muslim world, if you come to the problem from a faith-based approach, they're more likely to listen to you than if you come to them saying, hey, you know, uh, you, you still believe in religion? You know, why don't you modernize and become secular? That goes nowhere. And for the longest time, Karama was not appreciated by secular feminists in the U.S. Today, our time has come. Today what is happening is that a lot of people are coming asking for Karama to help, whether internally or externally. There are many Muslim women that have asked us to actually allow them to start branches of Karama in their own countries. We have spoken on various personal status code issues. I have consulted the, uh, in an arm of the Qatari government on, on family law. I've been asked now to, uh, on various family laws in other countries. Um, we are now uh, getting contacted on issues relating to Afghanistan, Nigeria, South Africa, and so on. So Karama has been growing since the last year in tremendous uh, ways. And our goal is to grow in a way that makes everybody feel that what we are doing is the right thing for these Muslim women at home and, at, and abroad. So I'm very happy to say that now that I look back at my history, the pinnacle of this history is happening right now with a lot of young women coming to us and saying, train us, we want to be the next generation of Muslim women who are going to follow uh, on the work that you are doing and who are going to uh, bring together uh, the Muslim women around the world. We might even have our first international Muslim women's conference here in the United States. So this is really a very important time for us. Um, we have to understand that basically the most important thing we do is education. That unless we lay the religious foundation properly, nothing is going to get done. We do not work out of the point of view that there is a conflict that we need to get caught in the middle of. To the contrary, we believe in conflict resolution. The real challenge for us, and I will finish with addressing this challenge, is the following. There are perceptions of the U.S. abroad now that are very important. And these perceptions we have to take into account as we work. What is the U.S. doing abroad? Is it a force for democracy and freedom? Or is it a force for domination? It is these two alternatives that are going to determine how we are going to work. If we work abroad and we are viewed as being a capitalist tool, we're not going to get anywhere. And if we work abroad as allies of people of faith who are trying to achieve the human rights of the various people in their community, we go much further. How do we balance this without getting caught into a very, very nasty situation abroad? 
For this, I can only ask that you give us our, your prayers and remember us uh, in your thoughts. But we are now in Karama at a very critical juncture. We have decided this morning, some of our board members are actually here at Harvard. We had a board meeting this morning, and we've decided that we're going to go ahead and take wise risks. But we cannot sit on the sideline because the situation is dangerous. We're going to do what we have to do, but we'll do it with honesty and hope that God will protect us. Thank you.